Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, my finest friends. Welcome to the sixth episode of season seven of the Tom Petty Project podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Brown. This is the weekly podcast that digs into the entire Tom Petty catalog, song by song, album by album, and includes conversations with musicians, fans, and people connected with Tom along the way. Uh, before we start today's episode, a couple shout outs to folks on social media. So talking about last week's song, My Life, Your World, uh, on Facebook, John Lynn Lake says, the first time I heard this song was on TPR, Tom Petty Radio, uh, after American Treasure came out. So my first thought was, WTF, that's from Walking From The Fire, uh, which had become one of my faves. But the song always takes me back to 1992 when I told my mum I voted for Clinton. So, you know, a great connection there to the idea of two people living in slightly different worlds. I also think that I maybe forgot to mention that lyrical connection with Walking From The Fire. So, you know what I'll do? Maybe I'll just pretend that I was always intending to reference that when I get to that outtake later on in the in the show. Uh, my pal Pete Nestor from the Honest and Unmerciful Record Review podcast commented on Twitter, The tone of this song is extraordinary. Those Boys of Summer-esque guitar fills are phenomenal, and the lyrics doing such a good job of painting a picture but not giving too much away. Very evocative of lost innocence and broken promises. He also mentions that he loves the delivery of the line, They said an aeroplane had fallen on my block. Uh, so thanks as always for the great comments, Pete. That Boys of Summer Sonic connection is present in at least two songs on this record, and you do get the sense that it was a, a, sort of thematically a direction that Mike was grooving on at that time. And folks, look, if you haven't checked out Honest and Unmerciful yet, you really ought to. I'll reshare their Wildflowers episode on social media again, and heck, I'll even leave a link in the episode notes because you've got to check it out. It's a great show, and they're wonderful, wonderful people. I also did get a note on the Damage You've Done episode from Edie Lott. I gave that song a 5 out of 10, and Edie says... I think this is the first time I truly disagree with your rating of a song. I've always loved this song and found myself singing it all on my own every once in a while. I would have rated it a seven. I'll let this one slide, she says. Uh, I truly enjoy your podcast. Thank you for doing it. Hey, no, thank you, Edie, for listening, um, genuinely. Um, it's great when people listen. It's great, even better when they sort of feed back and give me information, and especially if people disagree with me. I love that. You know, we all love different songs in this catalog to different degrees, and I do at least try to offer some reasons when I rate songs a little lower. So as I commented back to you, Though this is my least favorite Heartbreakers record, I've definitely come to appreciate it a little more in the last few weeks as I've immersed myself in it for this season. So yeah, thanks as always for the social media chat. Keep it coming. Um, today's episode is the opening track from side two of this season's album, The Fun Rocker, Think About Me. Think About Me is the absolute epitome of the DIY nature of much of this album. In conversations with Tom Petty, Tom explains to Paul Zolo, that's completely ad-lib, with me yelling out the chords. They had to actually go back and find another chord for the very first chord. It was clipped because the engineer wasn't rolling and he turned the tape on right as I started to play. You can really, really hear the spontaneous nature of this one right from the start. And there's a nice little nod back to the early days in the way Tom's rhythm guitar is panned hard right and Mike's lead is hard left. And it's crazy how quickly Mike falls into exactly the right part to complement what Tom's playing. There's a devilishly brilliant little lick that, to, that he plays at around 10 seconds leading into the drum fill, which kicks us into the meat of the song. It's a spontaneous lick that doesn't recur, like most improvised licks, uh, but it's so damn good. And when you hear what Benmont plays over top of it, it's yet another reminder of what an incredibly tight band the Heartbreakers were at this stage in their career. Mike even finds that little solo motif to lean into. The big upwards bend to the high root note. So that little bit. Terrible singing there. Hey? I'm sorry about that. I won't do that again. Um, the other cool pattern that Mike finds uh, is to hold off following Tom's rhythm exactly. The chord progression that Tom and Howie are following is A, G, D. So A up to G, down to D. But Mike doesn't hit the G. He plays the open A, which he suspends over the G, then adds in a little flare over the top of each D, whether it's that, you know, that string bend or a different little bit of business. And when you think this was all done on the fly, that's a superb bit of instinctual feel playing. The first verse is a fairly straight repetition of the main riff with Tom singing light throwaway lyrics in that strained choke sort of snarl he uses for these fun type of rock and roll songs quite often. Uh, you get Mike adding again more fills and Ben Mont playing his way around that same A, G, D progression um, on piano initially. The rhythm section takes along at a wonderful clip with Stan and Howie falling right into a rollicking 2-4 sort of two-step style beat that's it's almost like a country two-step or even, I, I said later on, like a rockabilly type thing. Howie's bass is nice and crisp and Stan's snare crack really accentuates each second beat in the bar. 
Another indicator of the ad lib nature of this song is when Tom goes into the chorus section and you get that A D A D D part. Stan clearly obviously doesn't know that there's going to be a slight rhythmic change there, so he plays straight through it and then picks up a slightly different pattern on the second playthrough. So that live off the floor feel really shines through in those little sort of sections on those turnarounds. We get another rip roaring little fill from Mike coming back out of this section and into the second verse, and Ben Mont moves to the organ to fill out the sound. Paul mentions to Tom that the song has some funny lyrics, to which Tom responds, God knows where they came from. It wasn't very serious, it was just meant to be a rock and roll song. And I already mentioned this, this sort of quote unquote disposable nature of the lyrics, which is not to say in any way that they're bad lyrics, they're just fun lines to bounce around the melody. Your boyfriend's got a big red car, he got a compact disc and a VCR. <laughs> Again, this kind of dates the song, but where Jamming Me really gets locked into its period by the very specific cultural references, I think these lyrics work because they're not really... The focus isn't on, you know, the, the things. It's describing someone who has a bunch of these things. It could almost be the same guy who has the money and the cocaine and then listen to her heart. It's the same idea of trying to lure someone with possessions rather than personality. And the second verse also sees Benmont adding in more organ and dropping the piano out. The verse itself plays out more or less uneventfully with only that keyboard change really moving the dynamic of the song ever so slightly. The bridge for this one just moves us up to that fifth chord and holds us there. That's the E. Um, and we have Benmont ripping it up on piano again before the guitars slash straight into a blazing 1960s rockabilly solo that almost has a Stray Cats quality to it. Now, interestingly, this solo is panned into the right channel, and to my ear has the same tone as the intro riff that Tom's playing, so I'm curious whether this was actually Tom playing this. I'd be cautiously confident that it is, because it doesn't quite sound exactly like Mike. The bends are just the bends are some, there's something about them that's slightly different. Um, coming back out of this section, though, and into the last verse, we get some filthy honky-tonk piano from Ben Mont, in which he really leans heavily into those seventh notes, and it just sounds so slick. The last verse just drops us back into the groove and leads us out into one last chorus, where Ben Mont switches to the organ again, before then playing both instruments in the outro, including some of the slickest piano up to this point in the Heartbreakers recorded catalogue. There's no fade-out on this one, as it's all wrapped up with a neat bow with one final D chord on the piano. Alrighty, folks, it's time for some petty trivia again. I've done a lot of these petty trivias now. Maybe what I'll do for a special episode sometime soon is uh, get some of my old guests back on and we can have a little trivia contest between them. Um, your question for this last week was, which of the following songs was not played during the Heartbreakers' final show at the Hollywood Bowl on September 25th, 2017? Was it A, You Don't Know How It Feels, B, Walls, C, Refugee, or D, Learning to Fly? The answer is Walls. The song was played extensively on the 40th anniversary tour, usually at around the sort of number eight, number nine slot, but was not included in the grand finale in LA. Half of the 18 songs from that performance were Heartbreakers tracks and half were solo recordings. The most represented album was Wildflowers, with five songs featured from Tom's masterpiece. Next was Full Moon Fever with four, and the debut record saw three tracks included. The remaining six songs were pulled, one each from Hypnotic Eye, Southern Accents, Into the Great Wide Open, Mojo, Damn the Torpedoes, only one track from Damn the Torpedoes, uh, and Mary Jane's Last Dance from 1993's Greatest Hits album. Your question for this week is this. Of the six Fillmore tracks that were previously included in the live anthology release, which is the only one not to have been included on last year's Live at the Fillmore box set? Is it A, Jam and Me, B, Goldfinger, C, Friend of the Devil, or D, Green Onions? Okay, back to the song. There's not much more to say on this one, really. It's a, it's a short song with few moving parts, recorded spontaneously, and has that feeling of sort of capturing lightning in a bottle, if ever so slightly late on the part of the sound engineer, according to Tom. Again, the lyrics hang around the title line, Think About Me. So it's another song that Tom's written from a sort of potential lover type perspective. Apart from some light relief in the middle with the compact disc and the CCR, the rest of the lyrics simply state and restate that the girl in question should be looking to Tom to get everything she needs. It's unsubtle and gloriously cocky and matches the cadence and groove of the track perfectly. 
Tom's vocal is tight, and the only overdubs I imagine ended up on this one are the vocal doubling and harmonies in some sections. And if I had to guess, well, I don't have to guess, but I'm going to guess, this is probably or possibly one of the first songs put together for the album, and I wonder if most of the off-the-cuff tracks were cut early on as the band settled into the studio to make another record. Um, it was played 28 times live, according to Setlist FM, and this is why I think it's one of the early ones, because the first time it was played was July 2nd, 1986, in Akron, Ohio. On that occasion, it was part of a very short eight-song set that I'm assuming was part of a, I don't know, either like a festival or a cabaret-type event at the now disused and partially demolished stadium. There's a great live version from Jacksonville on July 24th, 1987, that was released on the live anthology set. It's really, really close to the recorded version, but has a little bit of extra source added in a couple of places by Howie on the bass, as well as featuring his superb backing harmony vocals. I also wonder if Stan Lynch really needed a bathroom break during this song because he speeds up noticeably towards the end of the song by almost 10 beats per minute. So I'll put a link to that um, recording in the episode notes as well, um, and you can give it a listen. <laughs> Okay, friends, Romans, and country fans, um, that's it for this week. It's a very simple, very straight-ahead rock and roll song. It's not meant to do anything other than get your feet moving and your face smiling, and it knocks that out of the park. It's almost like the older, cooler cousin of anything that's rock and roll, the cousin with the leather jacket and the hot rod car. It has bags of swagger and personality and some excellent off-the-cuff work from the entire band, but in particular, Mike and Benmont. For me, it's the catchiest song on the album, and overall, probably my second favourite. So... I'm going to give Think About Me a 7 out of 10. I do remember that you can continue to support humanitarian efforts in Ukraine in many different ways, and I would urge you to do so if you have the means. Um, again, I've always I've kept a link in the um, episode notes to the Red Cross donation page, and it will stay there indefinitely. The Tom Petty Project is a proud member of the Deep Dive Podcast Network, so go check out all the shows um, over on Twitter at Deep Dive Podnet. You'll get a listing there, and I'm sure you'll find something that you like. Um, some great people over there doing some excellent work. Please check out And The Podcast Will Rock. Uh, that's my friends Corey and Mark. Uh, and do check out, um, like I said earlier, Honest and Unmerciful. They're not part of the network, but they bloody well should be. Um, you can also check out my other podcast, Seaside Pod Review, a Queen podcast on the same network. And if you're on Twitter, go to at Queen Seaside. On Facebook, go to Seaside Pod Review. Don't forget to follow this show on Facebook and Instagram and on YouTube at The Tom Petty Project and on Twitter at Tom Petty Project. Go follow, like, subscribe, do all those things, and please leave a review or a rating. I'll definitely go tell someone else about the show if you know they'd enjoy it. Um, keep talking to me on social media. I am going to start reading out more of your comments because I think that, you know, you're taking the time to interact with me, so I really should uh, read some of those out. If I don't get back to you as quickly on Instagram, I apologize for that. It's the platform that I use the least generally. Um, the Tom Petty Project is not affiliated with the Tom Petty Estate in any way, and when you're looking for Tom's music, please visit the official YouTube channel, go to official streaming platforms like Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Prime, uh, or as I keep telling you, go buy an LP, go buy a cassette, go buy a CD, buy a piece of physical merchandise. Then you own that. It's not in the cloud somewhere. Um, don't forget to check out the Tom Petty Nation and Tom Petty Fans Forever groups on Facebook. If you are not already a member, they're fun fan communities and they're well worth spending some time in. Until we meet again next week, keep listening to and sharing Tom's music. Try to be kind. Try to say I love you to someone at least once a day. Stay safe and healthy, and I'll be back with you next week to talk about side two, track two from Let Me Up I've Had Enough, all mixed up. Bye-bye.